I'm Robert Martinez, State Historian of New Mexico, and this is New Mexico History in 10 Minutes. In 1775, things were pretty bad in New Mexico. About 41 people had been killed by raids of Comanche, Apache, and Navajo Indians into the area, including 33 Sandia Pueblo Indians. In 1776, Fray Atanasio Dominguez reported when he went to Taos Pueblo that the whole Pueblo was fortified for protection against these raiding nomadic tribes. When he entered the Pueblo, there were Spanish people living there for protection. It was a very bad situation. New Mexico was under siege and had been for about 75 years. So what happens in 1778 is that the king finally decides that he needs to invest money in his northern areas of New Spain, uh, northern Mexico, if that area is to survive. Uh, Mendinueta said that he had to have this area secured or New Mexico could be lost. New Mexico could be lost and that would be catastrophic. So, in 1778, Croy uh, has a meeting in Chihuahua, in northern New Spain, the city of Chihuahua, and attending is Mendinueta, who's no longer governor of New Mexico, and other officials of the area, including a man named Juan Bautista de Anza, who was headed to Santa Fe to assume governorship of New Mexico. The situation is dire. He hears reports uh, from all of these officials about how bad it is uh, in the northern New Spain and uh, Texas, uh, Chihuahua, Sonora, New Mexico. Um, they're bad everywhere. There's, there's a danger in all parts of the Spanish Empire, but they're particularly uh, fierce in this part of the world where you have the Apacheria, uh, a huge movement of Apache peoples who are very aggressive and they have their own uh, needs and wants and uh, economic uh, requirements. So it's uh, quite a uh, uh, situation in uh Chihuahua, New Mexico, that area stretching from Paral up to Taos. Well, Croy has a plan. He tells Ansa that Ansa needs to secure an alliance with the Comanches and then use a strategy of divide and conquer to use the Comanche as auxiliary troops along with Pueblo people to go after the Apache tribes and armies. So, what do we know about Ansa? Well, he was a Basque born in Sonora, Mexico, and he had quite a lot of experience of fighting Native Americans in that area. And he made a name for himself in Sonora and then in California. But in New Mexico, he really um, uh, does something quite amazing uh, between the years 1778 and 1786. And here's what happens. In 1779, he assembles an army of New Mexicans up in San Juan Pueblo, now Okeawinge. Um, some of them are really experienced soldiers who are well-armed, but a lot of them are local men and Pueblo men who have very little in the way of weapons. Their horses uh, leave a lot to be desired, and uh, Anza really kind of... Uh, cringed when he saw them. So he has to uh, provide horses and weapons for these folks. And he gets about uh, 600 uh, men, and he decides that he has to go after the fierce and formidable leader of the Comanches. His name is Cuerno Verde, the Greenhorn, and that's because of a massive uh, buffalo headdress uh, he wore into battle with huge green horns, uh, uh, striking terror into his enemies. He was known as the scourge of New Mexico, and Anza knew that he had to challenge and defeat Cuerno Verde if he was going to secure an alliance with the Comanche. So he comes up with a plan to uh, break his army into uh, three groups, 200 each, to head into what's now Colorado to hunt down and defeat this formidable leader. So they go up the west uh, side of the Rockies and they take on a group of Comanches and defeat them and get information. And the information they get is that 
Cuerno Verde is already down in New Mexico pillaging and killing people and is making his way back up uh, towards the Arkansas River where they're going to have a celebration, uh, a victory celebration. So what uh, Ansa does is he takes his soldiers and he sends them in three different directions towards that point. And what they do is they ambush Cuerno Verde, who is surprised, but he's a very brave man, and he charges into the middle of the ambush, and when they figure out that they're surrounded by New Mexicans, uh, they kill their horses to, to form barriers, and they fight for their lives. Well, uh, Cuerno Verde does not go down easy, but he is defeated and killed, and so are many of his um, military leaders and his son. So this is uh, very important because what Anza is able to do is he heads south to Santa Fe carrying that headpiece as a trophy. And he uses it to secure an alliance with various Comanche groups. And it takes a while. He has to work with uh, different uh, peoples in Colorado and uh, east of New Mexico. But finally, in 1786, they all convene at Pecos Pueblo, and they uh, come to an agreement, a truce, a treaty. And it's quite impressive because um, the new leader really uh, forms an alliance, the leader of the Comanche, he forms an alliance with Ansa that will last a hundred years. It's quite fascinating. The, the Spanish are able to work with the Comanche, who then uh, go to war with Apache and Navajo people and finally give New Mexico some relief. Interestingly enough, uh, about 100 years later in the 1870s, 1880s, um, this agreement is still in place. Americans have a very difficult time moving through that part of the plains, the southern plains, uh, experiencing attack after attack by the Comanches, but Pueblo and the Hispano people move freely because of the peace secured by Ansa. So that is really his lasting legacy, uh, the peace that Ansa was able to secure with the Comanche. He attempted also to bring the Hopi people into uh, Spanish uh, governing influence, but he is less successful. He goes to the Hopi country and he finds that they're, they're devastated by drought and famine. Um, he wants to bring some of them back to uh, the central part of the New Mexico colony to be Spanish subjects. Some are willing to come, but the cacique, the liter leader of the uh, um, Hopi, is not willing to do that. Since the Pueblo Revolt, the Hopi had been a very independent people. And uh, he said that he and his people would rather perish than live under Spanish rule. So um, even though uh, Ansa was quite uh, sympathetic uh, to their uh, plight, um, they would not uh, agree to uh, work with him. So he had to leave uh, less successful with the Hopi than he was with the Comanche. Another thing that uh, Ansa did was he, he tended to continue that uh, uh, conflict between governors and Franciscan priests and while he was governor of New Mexico in the 1780s, he consolidated some of the pueblos and uh, got rid of some of the priests, the Franciscan priests, uh, in order to uh, save money for the crown. But it created a lot of work for the Franciscans, and it also created more tensions. And it could be said that this is the beginning of the end of Franciscan dominance in New Mexico. We'll see over the next... Uh, 15 to 20 years that Franciscan influence in this area will really weaken and will lead to an end of uh, Franciscan dominance here and the introduction of uh, secular priests. Uh, that means priests who don't belong to a regular order, rather they um, answer to the bishop. So this is going to be happening over the next 15 or 20 years. Um, another thing that happens under Ansa that I, I found fascinating is he issues a declaration against people putting up little altars along paths and roads where uh, family members died uh, because of Indian raids or accidents. It's 
they're descansos. They're descansos. And we know from records that people were doing this in New Mexico in the 1780s. And um, he did not like that and thought wanted it to stop. Um, he did not succeed, as we know, because even to this day, people still uh, put up descansos uh, along the road here in New Mexico. So finally, um, when uh, Ansa's uh, term as governor of New Mexico ends, he ends up back in Sonora, and um, he dies in 1788, but his legacy uh, as uh, one of the more um, uh, formidable uh, governors of New Mexico uh, carries on. He was a frontiersman. He was uh, every bit the heroic figure that you see uh, in people like uh, with names like uh, Boone, uh, Crockett, uh, and he also uh, had a, a legacy of conflict with native peoples, just like uh, those men did, and people like Kit Carson later on. So we have to have a balanced view of that as well. Um, so that's it for now. Um, this is New Mexico History in 10 Minutes. I will see you next time. Hasta pronto. Bye.